All right, up next, Scott Miller, CEO of Vision Critical, talking about the unfulfilled promise of big data, finding the right customer signal within the noise. Welcome, Scott. Part of the chicken do you actually use? What's actually in the nuggets? Is there any pink goop? They just use all like the beaks and the, the feet and chicken nuggets. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, That's nice. Beautiful. That's what you're getting in a basket of fries, which basically is about four medium fries. Hopefully, Mike, that answers your question. First time I ever saw that video, no joke, I was standing in front of 600 of my colleagues and our marketing department had said, oh, we're going to show a quick little video before you get on stage. As I got on stage having seen that, I actually wept. <laughs> the second time I was prepared to see it, it was at our customer summit a couple months ago. And I actually got up on stage and I actually still, my voice shook a little bit. So. Uh, this time, and every time since, I don't even watch that video. For me, the impact of that is the sheer immense power that any customer or consumer can have in the marketplace. And for me, thinking back 25, 26 years ago when I got involved in this space, that really, that potential, that belief that these things could happen is what brought me into, into this industry. And we are in the middle of a customer revolution. Just recently, Forrester came out with their CMO playbook and said, customer obsession must be the pillar of your marketing strategy. Uh, a weekend ago, uh, John Scully was interviewed. Uh, he's the guy, again, took over for um, Steve Jobs at Apple. Apple, the company that made the idea famous that customers don't know what they want, he said, the customer is now in control. Those are powerful admissions and statements for what's happening in the marketplace. So what's driving that? Obviously, it's technology. In the last decade, technology has enabled any individual on the planet with the right creativity and message to reach any other individual on the planet. 7.5 billion people, 10 billion devices. And they're all talking about really everything that matters to them. But the power is even broader than that. If you think about demographics, quick question, audience participation, how many people in this room are 30 or under? Stand up real quickly if you're 30 or under. Thank you. You people don't even remember what it was like in your adult life to live in a world where you couldn't do that, where you couldn't have that impact. And that's basically creating an expectation shift that is really sweeping across all enterprises. And that expectation is really simple. That customers expect to be treated like real people, not data points. Now that's great for the market research sector. We know from our own studies that when people believe that they matter, that they're being listened to, that response rates go way up. 
Pew Center re reported in 2012 that average survey response rates had gone from 35% in 1990 to 9% in 2012. And yet we know through engaged communities, like the story that Hans just told, that those response rates are in the 30, 40, even 50% range. And data quality improved when customers believe they matter and they're engaged, our ability to repeat studies and deliver the same results, the consistency of information improves. And finally, we all know that when people are engaged, they stay engaged longer when they believe they matter. Now the crazy thing is that this whole customer revolution should be just fueling the market research industry. But why is it that because customers expect to be treated like real people, all the investment in this industry is going into big data. There's a study recently released by ABI that marked um, the market research sector and the big data sector in terms of spend by the enterprise as similar, right around 30 to $35 billion. And yet while the investment going into market research will remain relatively stagnant for the next several years, the investment in big data will quadruple in the next four years up to over $100 billion. All the new money is going into big data, which isn't about customers actually being real people, now is it? So what's interesting about that is we know why big data is, so, is driving so much interest. Basically, there is so much of it. Everybody believes that somewhere the answer lies to just about every question. The other thing that's important about big data is that ultimately in those records is truth what somebody actually did at some point. And the whole game of big data is predicting that outcome and either understanding how to make sure that it happens or to make sure that it doesn't. So in market research, we've got an option, how we look at big data. We can either look at it as we can fight against it and we can continue to argue that it actually misses the mark. It is not reliable. We can concede and we can give up and say actually it's going to take over everything and once the R squared in a predictive model gets to one, the world is over. Or we can actually embrace big data as potentially the greatest catalyst in modern market research. And here's why. Because all that money going into big data, the enterprises are pouring now hundreds of billions of dollars into that in the next few years. And yet big data is not enough. And these are studies we've all participated in. Big data is the story in the enterprise, right? It basically tells people what they buy and when they bought it and how they bought it. It gives all that information, but it doesn't tell the enterprise why they bought it. And as long as there's not that explanatory variable, those data that help companies understand how to take that big data transaction information and convert it into an action, into a decision, into an execution of an idea, there is a gap. And there is an enormous opportunity for market research to provide uh, elements, variables that fill that gap. A subcomponent of big data, obviously, is social media. I'm going to tell a story similar to the one that Ben told about the Scottish election. This is a study that we released uh, about six months ago um, in collaboration with three of our customers was published in the Harvard Business Review. Um, and Harvard, by the way, is, is a, a small version in the United States of what you guys have out here in Oxford and, and Cambridge, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Anyway, um, our study showed that our these clients, that 65% of the, or 95% of the information that they were seeing in social media was being posted by a very small sample of their actual customers. And yet that's what they were listening to. It doesn't mean social data are wrong, social media wrong. It simply means that there's an opportunity for us to add more. So here's what Silicon Valley says. Silicon Valley calls this the noise. This is all the data that is being accumulated, so much so that in the next nine months, we will amass more data than has been amassed in the history of mankind up until this point. That's a lot of data. And what they're telling us is the enterprise doesn't need more data. Stop adding to the noise. The enterprise has plenty of data. The story is already written in the enterprise. It's already started with all the customer information that we have. 
anything from wearable technology to transactional information. What they don't have though, while the development of the noise is increasing, the signal, the ability to interpret that information and do something with it, is actually not. And as I look across all of the various methodologies and capabilities that have been shared here today, and even thinking back to last year, the opportunity for the market research world to take real people, to engage with them, and to use those individuals to help to connect the dots, to add explanatory variables, to make big data smarter, to make it more effective, to make it actionable, to use our methodologies not to create more noise, but to start creating and clarifying the signal within this amount of big data that's out there, again, creates an enormous opportunity. Uh, so much money being invested in there, and yet it under-fulfilling on so many of the opportunities that are there. And not only do we actually create new opportunities, but we start to tap into another sector. Not the $30 billion market research sector, not even the $100 billion big data sector, but we're talking about marketing technology and predictive analytics that right now is measured at about $1.3 trillion. Why are we not shopping in that space, adding value to that sector with the skills and the capabilities that we have? It is possible. It is being done. Let me tell you two stories. First, this is a client story on the way not to do it, and then I'll tell one about the way to do it. Because this is the way not to do it, this client will remain nameless. And it has to do with a smartphone and a guest satisfaction survey at a major uh, premium hotel chain. It's not what you think. It's not about completing that survey on my mobile device. Um, over Christmas break, my family and I decided to spend the last two nights at a very nice premium hotel just outside of Miami. Now, for our, any customers that are in the audience, don't worry. Yes, Vision Critical doesn't pay me enough to stay there, but I used points, so that's fine. Anyway, so we check in, we're late, we run down to dinner. My wife, because I've been on my cell phone most of the time, requires me to leave my cell phone in the room. An hour and a half later, we return from dinner. We've got mints on the pillow and a cell phone that's been removed from the room. Now, in 25 years of travel, business travel, I've never had a single item ever stolen out of a hotel room. So it was a different experience for me. Um, uh, the hotel was very aggressive, very accommodating, lots of interviews, due diligence, all that stuff is great. Nothing happened. A few days go by, a few more days go by. Eventually, a week later, I get an email from them. Finally, they're going to respond to my claim that my cell phone was actually taken. Dear Mr. Miller, as a valued guest of our hotel, would you please take a few minutes to fill out this satisfaction survey? Not what I was hoping for, but okay, I'm a researcher. I start filling it out. Hey, how was the front desk? Uh, was your room ready? How'd it look like? I'm on screen two. How was your room? Was everything included in, in your room when you got in that you expected? Yes, except one thing, my cell phone. So I, now I'm starting to move faster through this survey. It turned out to be over 100 questions. As I got, I didn't even think we did that anymore, quite frankly, in this industry. But as I got to the end, um, I was even to the point where I was at being asked about restaurants, right? So now, you know, Mr. Hotel, what restaurants I ate at. My story is already written, but you are so disconnected from my story that this satisfaction survey has actually turned out to be a detractor to my, to my commitment to your brand. The disconnection between the market research department and the operations department made a significant difference. And now you wonder why sometimes the CRM guys won't let the market research guys talk to their customers. Because if it's disconnected, it can go the wrong way. Now let me tell you about some, a couple great examples. Um, two brands, uh, customers of ours, Comcast and uh, iHeartRadio, two very large media conglomerates in, in North America. Now, I'm not going to talk about the specifics, but I'm going to talk about a couple best practices that they've discovered. First of all, they've made those stories the centerpiece of their marketing intelligence function. They're bringing data from set-top boxes and subscription information into their communities or even into the databases they're reaching. So before they even go and connect with a customer, they have the story. The second thing they're doing is they're mining the dashboards of the corporation to make sure they know what the issues are. They're generating the issues, not waiting for the various stakeholders to come to them and ask questions. 
The third thing is, because they have all the story, and because they have the rest of this information from the dashboarding, the surveys they do are very, very short. They're not non-strategic. They're actually the most strategic issues that the companies are facing. They're just very short and tactical because they know so much of the story already. The fourth thing that they're actually doing is they're realizing by properly engaging these customers that they're actually driving customer commitment and customer engagement in those brands up. By filling out surveys in the right way, by clarifying messages, by answering questions, they're actually driving intelligence. So if I look at what they're doing, again, the humility of the market intelligence or the, or the marketing intelligence function to say the story's out there. We just need to use our methods and tools in order to provide clarity of the story. It creates a very inspiring opportunity as far as I'm concerned for where this space and this market can go. And if we can get around how we actually start solving the gaps in big data, we have the opportunity to generate a revolution of ourselves. Thank you very much and good luck. Questions for Scott? Up, oh, got one back here. Martha Williams from um, House of Pi. Um, I'm just wondering with what you were saying, how you see with the sort of mobile data going towards the more developing countries, whether any of the things you've talked about are actually gonna change with the different cultures there? Just in terms of mobile data collection? Yes. Um, uh, I actually, other than the pace at which it's being collected, w we don't see a lot of a difference there uh, either. So, for example, we're having a, a quite a bit of success in, in building communities in, in South Africa, um, in developing uh, parts of, of India and China as well. And, you know, smartphone penetration, it has its pace, but also if we look at the revenue model, in, in cell phones, as we all know, and, and telecoms, it's actually starting to flip as well. We're getting to the point where it's in the interest of the enterprise to make it more and more attractive for somebody to have a smartphone because that is the way they can reach them. So we may actually see in the next five to 10 years that revenue model flip. Is it conceivable that we might be paying customers, even in emerging markets, to use their smartphones so that we can get access to them? So pace is one thing but I really don't see it as, um, uh, as that different. Yes, in Latin America, in particular parts of uh, developing Sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's moving more slowly. Face-to-face -face is still very inexpensive, but at the same point, technology is eventually reaching everybody. Thanks, great question though. Any other questions? Great, Scott, thank you, thank you so much. much. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, yeah.